In previous videos I've talked about, um, and friends have talked about, uh, how medicine is approached by different cultures throughout the world and throughout history. Um, but in this video I'm going to do something a bit different. I'm going to talk about an instance where Western biomedicine and early medieval medicine coincide in quite a surprising way. And you might well have already heard about this research, and there's, there's a very good chance that many of you have. Um, and if you have, hopefully you enjoy this video anyway. Um, one thing I would say at, at the start of this video is absolutely check the description to see if I've put any corrections there from people because I'm, you know, I don't have a medical degree. Um, so thank you very much to anyone who does provide corrections, but hopefully I don't get too much wrong. Staphylococcus aureus is a species of bacterium that lives on humans and usually doesn't cause any problems, but occasionally it becomes pathogenic, which means it causes illness. And the exact kind of illness it causes depends on where on the body it is. But one thing it can do is cause abscesses, which are build-ups of pus in the skin, um, sort of like a very severe spot. And this species of bacterium has lived on humans for a very long time, and it's historically been treated with penicillin. And some strains evolved resistance to penicillin at some point in the 20th century, so it no longer worked on them anymore, because they produced an enzyme that broke down penicillin molecules before they could do their job. So people started treating these strains with a drug called metacillin, which was resistant to this enzyme. And then some strains of penicillin-resistant staphylococcus developed an extra defence. Um, normally these drugs work by binding to particular proteins in the bacteria, but these strains of bacteria changed those proteins so that penicillin-like drugs could no longer naturally bind to them. And we call these bacteria methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, or in the US sometimes MRSA. And this has become a big problem in hospitals because now that it's resistant to all of these antibiotics, it's very hard to treat and it can cause nasty infections in wounds and things. Although MRSA has only become a problem in the last few decades, staphylococcus infections have clearly been around for thousands of years, and a group of researchers from the University of Nottingham and Texas Tech University in 2015 discovered that one of many uh, remedies in Bald's Lachebork, which is a 9th century English medical textbook that I think I've discussed here before, uh, one of these recipes was probably a treatment for the abscesses caused by staphylococcus infections, specifically infected eyelash follicles. And the remedy goes like this. Work auch self with one. Je nimm kroplauk und garlauk brau im Fella. Je knoe well to somne. Je nimm wien und faures jaulen brau im Fella. Je meng with thylaches. Do somne on arfat. Lat stand on nion nicht on sam arfat. Au ring thur klaas und flüttre well. Do on horn und im nicht do mit fedre on auge. So the salient ingredients to the speaker seem to be garlic, another plant in the garlic family like onions or spring onions, bear in mind crop had a broader meaning back then than it does now and it doesn't necessarily imply this is a cultivated species, although it could have been. Um, wine, ox gall, which is bile taken from an ox, um, and it has to be in a brass vessel, it has to stand for nine nights, and it has to be wrung clear, stalled in a horn and then applied to the eye at night with a feather. And this kind of thing is fairly standard for an old English medical uh, recipe. So you have to use specific ingredients, but it's also quite specific about the context that the remedy has to be applied in. Um, so it has to be applied at night, um, and it's, uh, it's quite specific about the materials that the equipment used to make the recipe uh, and serve the recipe should be made of. The researchers noticed that a lot of the ingredients the author specifies actually do contain chemicals that are known to have specific antimicrobial properties. They go into more detail in the paper, but plants in the garlic family contain chemicals that can stop certain bacteria being able to learn about their surroundings through quorum sensing um, and stop them forming biofilms, which are layers of lots and lots of bacteria that are more resistant to antibiotics than individual bacteria cells are. There's lots of evidence that copper has antimicrobial properties as well, and the authors point to a paper that suggests chemicals found in garlic-like plants might act synergistically with copper in an antimicrobial way. In other words, they might work with copper to produce an antimicrobial effect that's greater than the effect they would have on their own. So it seems likely that if you made this salve, it would have some antimicrobial properties, but the researchers were curious about whether um, the ingredients were working synergistically with each other. So in other words, was every single ingredient important to the recipe, or was it just one or two important ingredients with a few other things thrown in that didn't really do anything? 
They made several batches of the recipe. Some of them had all the ingredients, including a brass sheet to simulate the brass container. Some of them had an ingredient missing. Some were left for nine days as per the recipe, uh, and some were tested immediately without the nine day waiting period. They grew colonies of Staphylococcus in some synthetic soft tissue, and they tested all their versions of the recipe to see whether they do anything to the Staphylococcus. Not only did the recipe work, but all four of the organic ingredients were necessary for the recipe to be most effective. If you remove any of them, it's less effective. Removing the brass didn't have much of an effect at all, but leaving the recipe for nine days did seem to increase its effectiveness. It seems like nine was an important number to early medieval people in England, and it pops up in a lot of medical texts in various contexts. Um, presumably the efficacy just increases if you leave the recipe for a while, and nine days had significance to early medieval people, so that's the number of days they tended to do it for. So then the researchers infected some mice with MRSA, which is the methicillin-resistant version of Staphylococcus that didn't exist uh, in the ninth century, and they tested the cells to see what would happen. And although uh, the MRSA was not gone completely, the salve did seem to massively reduce the number of viable bacteria um, in the wounds that they administered. So although that can't necessarily be extended to humans, and this is not, you know, this is not some cure for MRSA that's suddenly been discovered, it does show uh, that at least certain people in the ninth century were aware of the kinds of things that had antimicrobial properties and also aware of the fact that those things could act synergistically with each other to produce a greater effect than any of the individual ingredients. And the authors give this as evidence of people basing medicine on empirical knowledge that they've arrived at using something like the scientific method. And I'm in two minds about this. Um, I think it sort of raises questions about what counts as the scientific method. The application of the scientific method here may have been spread over centuries or millennia. So it's not, uh, well, I don't think the authors are necessarily suggesting that, that, that there was a short period of lots of empirical, uh, empirical research as there has been nowadays. Um, but yeah, it could just be a matter of, you know, a community substitutes ingredient B for ingredient A because they don't have enough of ingredient A, ingredient B turns out to work better and that's what they use from then on. It's not necessarily a focused um, scientific effort to produce remedies. It's more a, a gradual building up of a framework of how um, certain ingredients work and how they can work synergistically with other ingredients. Um, and I think it would be, yeah, it'd be very interesting to look further into this, although unfortunately we don't have proto-Germanic medical textbooks and things like that, so the, you know, it's difficult to tell um, to what extent this was a recent scholarly focus on medicine and to what extent it was just um, kind of folk remedies that were more sophisticated by modern standards than we might have realised they were. And another thing to think about is the fact that the ingredients might have been prepared uh, or they might have been sort of pre-prepared in a way that's not um, described in the text because maybe it was obvious to the people writing the text and they assumed it would be obvious to the people reading the text. So for example, are you supposed to dry the ingredients? Are you supposed to crush them and keep them in a jar for a certain amount of time? Um, you know, this isn't something that's described in the larger book, but it might have been something that people assumed was obvious. Um, and it might be something that increases the antimicrobial properties of, um, of the ingredients. So uh, there are things like that to consider as well. I wish all of the researchers uh, that were involved in that study the very best, and I hope they don't mind me talking about their research in this video. I would encourage anyone to go and read it. I think it's open access because I can still access it despite my lack of university affiliation. Um, it may not be, but in any case, um, yeah, I would encourage you to read as much about it as you can because it's very interesting and there's a lot more in the study than I've uh, talked about here. Thank you very much for watching and I will talk to you soon.